Okay, welcome to the video recording for chapter one. So in this chapter, it's going to be um, a little bit light on content. It's mainly an introduction to thermodynamics. So uh, there's a few objectives for this chapter. The first one is just to identify vocabulary associated with thermo. Um, we're going to review briefly the metric SI unit system, as well as explain some basic concepts uh, uh, some basic concepts associated with thermodynamics, as well as review the concepts of temperature and temperature scales and pressure. And then we're going to go through the problem solving techniques that we're going to be using to solve problems in this in this course. So the first thing that comes up is what is thermodynamics? Right? It's a it's a science of energy. Thermodynamics is a science of energy. It's basically a science that allows you to equate um, different uh, forms of energy and how they interact. So it deals with aspects of energy and as well as energy transformation. So examples of this would be uh, power generation, right? If you think about power plants and how they produce electricity, well, it really is just the conversion of one form of energy to another, and we convert it into a form that's practical for use, such as electricity. Uh, other aspects, refrigeration, whether or not you might have thought about it, your refrigerator or air conditioners that you use, for your homes or um, shopping markets or malls or whatever, those are also thermodynamic systems and use the principles of thermodynamics to, to work. And it also has to do with relationships among properties and matter, right? So it basically it helps to define properties that um, uh, use properties that quantify different aspects of matter that can be used to quantify uh, energy conversion during processes. So energy conversion itself is a fundamental law of nature. Um, it is the principle for which you may have heard before that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Right? So that means that we don't actually create energy. Some people have the thought that like power plants, for example, create energy. It doesn't create energy. The energy is already existing in one form, and all it does is change the form from one form to another. Right? So basically what power plants do, it takes energy um, built up uh, and then it takes energy and transfer from heat and converts it to mechanical work. And that mechanical work um, goes ahead and drives a, um, a generator that produces electri electricity. You may have heard of uh, something called the first and the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, what the first law of thermodynamics is, it's an explanation of energy conversion. So what it does is that it basically uh, helps quantify how much energy is being converted from one form to another. And it also asserts that energy is a thermodynamic property. So some of you might be thinking, okay, great, what does that mean? If I can quantify energy as a thermodynamic property, that means I can quantify how much of that energy from one form is being converted to another. And um, you may have heard the basic premise um, e in minus E out equals delta E system. What this whole thing is, is just it's a whole energy conversion process where if I have a system, which we're going to talk about later, all the energy into the system has to either leave the system or cause the system to change in energy. And this is the whole principle. This is basically what the first law of thermodynamics is written out into one equation. This is what we're going to be applying in this class for the majority of problems that we do in the first several chapters. But, but it's not sufficient just to know the first law. There's also a second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics asserts that energy has a quality as well as a quantity. So what does that mean? That means that how much of the energy, like let's say I have a certain amount of energy in one form and I want to convert it to another how much of that energy is actually convertible, right? How much uh, energy can I convert based on the process, based on efficiency and everything? So that's what the second law asserts. Um, and it also basically asserts that processes occur in a direction of decreasing quality. And what does that mean, basically? For example, heat transfer, right? Heat transfer goes from hot to cold. It doesn't go from cold to hot. That's what the second law helps qualify that. So the validity of the laws is you probably... Um, are happy to know cannot be proven by math. They are the, the validity of these laws rest on experience and observation. 
And we are going to be using the fundamental models, models, right? Models are equations that govern how something works. We're going to be using the fundamental models of the first and second law uh, for this whole class. This whole class is based on those two principles. So there's two basic types of thermodynamics. There's classical thermodynamics and statistical thermodynamics. You'll be happy to know that we're going to be concentrating on classical thermodynamics, which this is a first course in, right? It's a macroscopic approach. Uh, does not require knowledge and behavior of individual particles, and it provides a direct and easy way to the solution of engineering problems. That is where we're going to be. I use the word easy lightly. Uh, thermodynamics is a tough class, uh, mainly because um, if you're taking this class, as a sophomore, which is typically in our curriculum where you take it, um, it's a first course that you've had in this area of engineering, and so it can seem really tough at first, and it is. But as you practice and as we go forward, you're going to see um, that uh, all the problems we do fall under the same basic analytical approach um, where we're going to be applying a problem-solving technique. Same problem-solving techniques are going to be used each time to help um, you be able to pretty much attack any problem that we throw at you. The other one, statistical, I'm not going to really cover it too much, but it looks at macroscopic or microscopic and molecular approach to thermodynamics. That would be a more advanced course. So what are different applications of thermodynamics, right? So we talked about air conditioning systems, right? Air conditioning systems, what do they do? Air conditioning systems, if you think about it, people think they make cold. And that's one way of looking at it, but a correct thermodynamic way of looking at it would be it actually makes heat flow in the opposite direction of nature, right? If I have a hot temperature and a cold temperature, heat wants to flow in the direction between hot to cold. But what a refrigerator does is that it makes the heat flow from cold to hot. That's the opposite way in nature. And the only way to make that happen is by putting work into a system to cause that to happen, right? The example is if, uh, if I'm in a room that's at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and outside it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, well, what the, in nature, what wants to happen is that heat wants to flow through the walls into the room until the room temperature is at 80 degrees, 100 degrees as well as, you know, which, which is the same temperature as it is outside. But to maintain the room at 70 degrees, I constantly have to reject heat out of the room. Well, the only way to do that is to have work being put into the, into the system. In this case, it's done by the compressor of a air conditioning system, right? Another one is your car radiator, right? Your car radiator has, takes water, goes in, goes through this uh, uh, heat exchanger, which basically takes outside air, goes through these fins in order to cool down the water as it comes out. Power plants. We talked about power plants earlier. Power plants work on a thermodynamic cycle where basically you're constantly taking a fuel, burning it, or a nuclear reactor that produces heat. But the idea is that you're taking heat and you're converting it to work. And there's only a certain amount of heat that you can convert into work. And, therm and uh, the thermodynamics uh, helps define the limits as to how much heat can be converted to work. And based on that, also how much uh, efficiency you have to quantify the actual amount of work that you get out of the system, right? These are how power plants work. Airplanes, these are, these are, um, these, uh, these engines work on the principle of accelerating air by compressing it through a turbine, right? And, and what happening is that as the air accelerates throughout, through the exit of the engine, it causes a thrust. That's all based on thermodynamics, what we call a compressible airflow. And again, a refrigerator here in the household refrigerator operates in the same premise in the same exact cycle as an air conditioning system. So all of these are thermodynamic applications. Other ones too, you might not think about it, but your body is a thermodynamic system, right? You're, you're warm-blooded, so we have uh, a system that produces metabolic heat, right? Metabolic heat is heat leaving the body. Uh, we try to maintain uh, a sort of thermodynamic equilibrium where we're not losing more heat than the body's maintaining. So we wear clothing when it's cold out um, in, order to be, in order to keep some of the heat in our body. Um, an example of this, my PhD was developing wetsuits, right? So people will think like, well, how does wetsuit, how is that an engineering project? Well, it's heat transfer engineering. When you're in water, right? If you're swimming in water, the water is cold. And water removes heat from your body 
several times faster than air. And so we're not designed to exist in water for very long because we don't really have the tolerance to to um, support large changes in water in uh, water temperature because our body can't produce enough body metabolic heat to keep us warm. So we wear a protective garment, which is a wetsuit, in order to maintain the body heat inside the body, right? And so the our challenge was to develop a wetsuit that could uh, maintain a diver at a thermodynamic equilibrium over a long period of time. These were for uh, uh, Navy SEALs so that they can actually um, maintain their body temperature in such a way that their hands don't crimp up, right? Your hands crimp up because your blood is the mechanism for which your body distributes heat throughout uh, throughout your body. So if your hands are getting too cold, your hand is dissipating too much heat, your body restricts blood flow to the hands in order to keep the your core warm, which causes your hand to crimp up. You know, it's called vasoconstriction. And so what happened was we just need to keep the body warm in order for the blood to constantly flow to the hands so that the divers still have hand dexterity. It's a big thermodynamic problem. Uh, when we consume food, your body metabolizes the food and converts it into energy in order to allow your legs to work, your arms to work, your brain to work, right? That's all done by the food we eat now. Um, all the, the different foods your body processes differently, of course, right? I mean, it's more healthy to have some fruit and vegetables than it would be to be eating candy all day. But the point is that they all work in the same premise. All right, so continuing, let's look at dimensions and units. Any physical quantity can be characterized by, dim by, uh, by dimensions, right? Uh, the arbitrary magnitudes of signs and dimensions are called units. So dimensions would be an example would be mass, length, and time. And the unit for mass is kilogram, the unit for length is meter, and the unit for time is second. Right, so there's two basic types of units. We have primary and secondary. Right, primary units are what we call fundamental units. You cannot break down the unit any more than this fundamental. And some examples of that is mass in kilograms. I can't break kilograms down into a more basic unit. Length, right? I can't break down, for example, meter into a more basic unit. Time has a fundamental unit of seconds. I can't break down seconds into a more fundamental unit. Secondary units are derived from fundamental units. Right, so they're expressed in terms of primary units. Example is velocity, right? Velocity is meters per second, right? It's expressed based on primary units. Energy, joule, that can be broken down to basic units. Volume, meters cubed, right? This meters multiplied by itself three times. So that's also a uh, based on the primary units. And then there's two basic types of units, right? English and SI units. I assume at this point that you've had some courses in the past that have dealt with English and SI units, so I am not going to take uh, time to describe the differences between those two units. I'm going to assume that you've had enough in prior courses to satisfy this course's need. All right. Uh, I, I, I would assume that you know the difference between weight and mass, right? Mass is a fundamental quantity, whereas weight is a gravitational force applied to the body. So weight is equal to mass times gravity, right? So if I'm uh, on the moon or on the earth, I have the same mass, but since the gravity is different on the moon and the earth, my weight would also be different. Uh, there's also the concept of dimensional homogeneity. The basic idea between this term of big words is that you can't add apples and oranges. What does that mean? That means basically when you go ahead and you add numbers together in thermodynamics, make sure they're in the same units, right? For example, if I look at this expression down on the bottom of the slide, I have um, energy I'm trying to compute, and I am adding 25 kilojoules plus 7 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, I hope when you look at this, you notice that you can't add them together because 25 has units of kilojoules. And seven has a units of kilojoules per kilogram. I can't add those two together, right, um, directly. I'd have to convert this into kilojoules or convert the 25 kilojoules into kilojoules per kilogram in order to be able to add those two numbers together. And it's really important because it's easy in the number of calculations and the number of different properties that come into play when you do analyses in this class 
it's important to make sure that your units are the same when you're adding them together. It's something that's easy to forget. Um, so I would ask that you make sure that you star this slide in order to be able to keep this in mind as you go through your homework assignments and take exams. All right. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I did want to mention the concept of unit conversion ratios. Basically, what it is is that it converts a um, secondary unit into primary units, right? For example, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, right? Or a pound force is 32.174 pound mass per feet second squared. Uh, a lot of these are in the back of your book, so you can look them up in terms of how much of one uh, unit is equal to how many of another equivalent units. Um, sometimes they're listed in what's called a unitary or a unity conversion ratio. So, for example, if I just take this right and I divide through by kilograms meters per second squared, I get what's called a unity, right? One, and that's equal to one newton per kilogram meter per second squared. Uh, we're not going to be dealing with this concept as much as we will just here, which is simple conversion of one unit to another. So. Just I would take note on the back of your books where that is located so that you can get to that when you need it um, during your homework 